I just didn't think it was going to get that bad. It took me a while to get to the point to say, this is really coming, and this is the worst thing I've ever seen in, in my career. Everybody drove to work with butterflies in their stomach. There was some fear, but there was also the feeling that this is what we've been called to do. Just days after UMass Memorial set up its command center on March 12th of 2020, it had its first confirmed case of COVID-19. What followed, some may describe as acts of bravery, commitment born in a calling, and incredible displays of human kindness. This is Chronicle on WCVB Channel 5. Welcome to our Monday, February 22nd, Command Center 8 a.m. briefing. Inside UMass Memorial Medical Center in Worcester, a daily meeting, now 365 days deep. We saw a positivity rate of 6.7%. That's greater than 50% down from the peak. Positive news that Justin Precor, Chief of Nursing, says is a stark contrast to how the command center opened under a cloud of uncertainty. There was a bit of uneasiness, definitely for the frontline caregivers. Did they have the right protection? Were they doing the right things? There was a bit of, okay, how many of these patients are we going to see? Is this the first of many or is this the first of a few? To date, UMass Memorial has treated more than 20,000 coronavirus patients, but the true number could be much higher. The staff here will never know exactly how many people came through these doors infected with the virus. It was quite frustrating. Pretty much on a daily basis, we were calling the you know, mass DPH and having testing say it was just not available yet. Dr. Richard Ellison is the hospital's epidemiologist, playing a pivotal role researching and advising the hospital community during the pandemic. He began his career four decades ago in the height of the HIV epidemic. But he faced a new question, how to keep a staff safe without sufficient protection. We've never encountered this. Even in the 1980s, we were not dealing with issues with lack of supplies. Usually in a natural emergency, it's local. So if a city has a problem, there are supplies in other cities. This was gonna be a national problem. There is no stockpile to fill every city in America at once. CFO Sergio Melgar says the hospital was using supplies at 10 times the normal rate, and they were dangerously close to being completely depleted of masks, barely able to help themselves or nearby communities. I had a call from our director of supply chain who said they want our body bags. They want to ship them to New York. I literally said, we're going to need the body bags. To me, that was probably uh, emotionally probably the most difficult day. Staff scoured the internet, purchased hundreds of thousands worth of supplies on their own, the community donating millions of pieces of PPE. We were getting donations from the community, some of which were very, very good, valuable, usable stuff. Warehouse manager Frank Perella says nothing went to waste. Workers putting in 80 hour weeks trying to secure supplies. And the hospital CEO worked alongside his medical colleagues. If I had stopped seeing patients during this, I don't think I could have lived with myself and I don't, I don't think I could have looked in the eyes of my fellow caregivers that I had to ask to not just do their previous job, but work 80 hours in a week in what is really the most dangerous situation we've ever put them in. More than 1,400 employees here became infected with COVID-19, about 10% of the total staff. Nurses here in these critical care units not only treating the community, but also colleagues. Among the first to get sick were doctors Justin Makel and Dr. Savant Mehta. There was so much unknown about the infection, how it would progress over time, and then there were limited treatment options as well. Being a doctor doesn't make you immune to the fears of infection. I have an anesthesia colleague who had talked to me in February about how COVID patients were behaving, and he told me that there were people who came to the ER, they had symptoms and they looked okay, and they were sent home, and then they came back one week later and dropped dead in the ER. So when Dr. Mehta came down with a fever and his oxygen levels dropped, he went to the ER. Turns out, just in time. Apparently, I was going down the tubes pretty rapidly. 
you know, I was going into multi-organ failure and they had tried everything. He was now in the same position that many of the first victims of pandemic find themselves, with few known resources to help them survive. When I learned that Savant was in the ICU, it just sort of created this sense of urgency. Dr. Makel was on the mend. He already was intrigued by the possibility of donating plasma, a technique used before, but a program not yet set up for COVID-19. When we first reached out to the American Red Cross, they thought we might be able to partner within a month or so. And we told them we don't have a month, we have, you know, hours. Hours later, Makel would be one of the first in the state to roll up his sleeves to donate plasma. Dr. Maida would become one of the first patients to receive plasma therapy. Within 24 hours of my getting the second dose, it was like miracle. A miracle that would ultimately give doctors and nurses a new tool to treat patients who are in need of life-saving treatment. Early on, it was all about innovation. When hand sanitizer ran low, students at the medical school made it. When they ran into problems with the sanitizer pumps, warehouse staff engineered a battery pack to keep them running. Within weeks, the tech department created an iPad communication system for staff to easily connect with families. It was all hands on deck. And now the hospital says they are making permanent changes from lessons learned, including expanding its warehouse storage capacity. Coming up, the power of healing hands.